The October 14, 1997 school board meeting is called to order at 7.30 p.m. Could we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is adjustments to the agenda, and we have two, three. three. Uh, we have a request for permission for a field hockey trip. We have some additional middle school co-curricular positions, and a motion from the Finance Committee relative to the Furnishings Committee. Are there any others? Are yes. Are allowed to bring anything else to the table? Um, under communications, I know there are parents here concerned about some issues with the kindergarten and possibly first grade situation. Under communications, we have a recommendation by a board member, and that person will bring that forth at that time. Thank it's you. not an action item, it's a recommendation. Okay, seeing no other adjustments. Um, Approval of the school board meet, meeting minutes of the regular meeting of September 9th, 1997. Any adjustments? And also a special meeting on September 16th, 1997. Any adjustments? Seeing none, the minutes stand. Our next will be comments about the high school representatives. Hello. <clears throat> My name's Ryan Moore. I'm a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, I'm Matt Martin, also a junior at Cape High School. And since last time we saw you as an SAC, we've met two times, and we've also had a retreat um, over at the Cape Shore building. And at that retreat as uh, SAC, we established three goals that we would like to accomplish, and uh, we've discussed them, and we, or we had many, and we narrowed it down to three. Um, they are, we decided that we'd like to increase student involvement in activities, um, both going to sports events and helping out with class, uh, fundraising and stuff like that. Um, also, we decided to continue the service project that we did last year with the Special Olympics. We thought that was uh, very successful. We enjoyed it, and we'd like to do another one like it. We haven't discussed it, but we will continue to in later meetings. And. Uh, our number one goal, though, the one that we've discussed um, thoroughly in our two meetings was to strengthen the communication with the school board and um, something that Mr. Sweeney talked about the first day of school and uh, we've focused on it um, as an SAC and as an SAC we devised a uh, letter that Ryan will read to you now. Dear Cape Elizabeth School Board members, the Student Advisory Council of Cape Elizabeth High School would like to send a greeting to you for the 1997-98 school year. Enthusiasm is at a record high as the student body of the high school becomes involved in dozens of activities. The atmosphere is one of smiling faces and kind regards. We would like to welcome you into our lives in a variety of ways. We have a sense that in the past several years there has been many missing links in the relationship between the students and the school board. At this time, the student body would like to put forth an effort to improve understanding and communication. We would very much appreciate your presence in our school. We cordially invite the board members who can arrange to do so to spend a day at the high school with a student guide. If you're interested, which we hope you will be, please give your name and phone number to either Matt or Ryan tonight. From there, an SAC member will call you to set up a convenient date for the both of you. We understand that the school board agenda is published a week or less before the actual meeting. This often leaves our representatives with little time to prepare a response to issues with adequate input from the student body. We therefore would like to ask if there is one member of the board who might volunteer to speak with one of our representatives on a regular basis. 
This would allow more opportunity for us to know about topics of concern in advance. We plan to set up subcommittees in which students discuss their opinions and communicate these to the representatives. Our representatives will then come to the board meetings prepared to speak on behalf of their classmates. We believe that the input of the students would help you to make important decisions on issues which involve us. As stated earlier, we're dedicated to improving student body school board communications and hope that you will see this as a worthwhile effort. We look forward to working more closely with you and seeing you in our hallway soon. Sincerely, the Student Advisory Council, Cape Elizabeth High School. Uh, so at this time, if there's anyone who thinks that it would even be uh, possible or is interested in being the member of the school board who um, would like to spend a day at the high school with a student guy, it doesn't have to be one of the SAC members, but um, anyone who's involved, just give your name and Matt will write it down. We'll uh, get in touch later on to arrange the proper time. Do you want to do that now by a show of hands or <laughs> anyone? <laughs> 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 Mr. Ridge, Mr. Swing, Mr. Greer. I think we were um, we were invited last year, and some yeah. of us were uh, d a little disappointed that we um, we weren't sure if we were the ones singled out as um, <laughs> not being the the popular ones or what. We were getting a little bit of a complex about not um, some actually got invited and others were sort of right. left out. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I, I think it's just a matter of time. And uh, so we'll, we'll look forward to uh, yeah. follow up on that. Maybe Definitely. That. Very excited. Um, also, just to be thinking of the person who um, we're kind of hoping there would be, since our SAC has elected us as uh, representative to the school board, if, if maybe one of you um, would be sort of a representative to the, to the high school. I know Mr. Sweeney has already spoken to us at the, at the uh, first day of school, so if someone we could sort of communicate on a regular basis so that we would know, um, on, like on issues beforehand, before meetings we would know of and other things that we could talk about. When are your meetings? Um, I don't think we brought a schedule tonight. Uh, Do, are they a weekly that, meeting? Yeah, every six days. Okay, yeah, the meeting. Every six class days. Mm -hmm. All right. I think if you if you could get the principal to forward that on to myself or the superintendent, and then we can look at making sure someone monthly meets with you prior to a school board meeting. Great. That would be very helpful. Okay. Thanks. Well. Um, Keep in touch. We'll we have to. We'll give the information to the school board and see how. And Mr. Perry told us that he would give us the numbers, and we'll call you and arrange a day that you'll be able to come to school and see what life is like at the high school. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, middle school representatives. If you could state your names, please. We we'll welcome you. I'm Sarah Nelson, and I'm Chelsea Burr, and we are the school board reps for the middle school this year, and we have other school student council members this year who are Julia Dunphy, who is president, Jimmy Salikas for vice president, co-vice president Brian Flynn, secretary Doria Valley, treasurer Burgess Everett, historian Matt Unger, Sixth grade reps, Jacqueline Crane and Anna Metzger. Seventh grade reps, David Faraday and Luke Holden. And eighth grade reps, Carly Fortunato and Carl Nemitz. Um, for the student council news, um, we've started a sweatshirt sale. Um, well, we're starting it soon. And it, we've done it in a couple years past, and it's been pretty successful. Um, we're also talking about giving the or we've decided on giving the juniors a dance this year to help them raise money because they came to the student council and talked us into giving them one because they had <laughs> some good ideas and stuff. And we're going to start thinking or talking about doing this thing. We might start it um, selecting student awards for like kindness and courtesy among students and stuff for someone each week who's been really helpful and stuff and done some nice things. Um, the student council will once again be involved in the Thanksgiving food drive sponsored by a local radio station. Um, we will be collecting canned goods at um, our November 14th social from 7 to 9 at the high school for the 5th and 6th grade dance. Uh, for the sixth and Our dance for the 7th and 8th graders is October 17th from 7 to 10 and it's 
pretty fun, but we don't have our DJ yet. But no, we do. <laughs> but, okay. Um, our middle school progress reports are coming out are coming out on October 16th, and our grades for them closed last Wednesday. Um, our sixth grade is in the middle of a Chewanke gift wrap sale, and they're involved in starting marsh trips. The science classes are going to the marsh. Um, the seventh grade is um, in the middle of planning their science museum trip that will be held in November or December. And the eighth grade will be going to Augusta on October 27th, 22nd. And our fifth grade, um, some of the classes have started the D.A.R.E. program. They're pretty excited about that. And um, we were discussing, me and Chelsea, about making a newsletter to the students about what goes on at the school board meetings and about the different people in the school board and what they do. And um, we were also thinking of the same idea as the high school students about um, doing the, where you come to our school and see what our day-to-day -day life is like. And if any of you are interested in doing that, we could talk after the meeting or something. And, um, Kelsey? <laughs> um, our eighth grade boys um, brought up a football petition and they got 150 signatures. And most of them played um, in South Portland or another team that had football. Not many teams have football and it's really expensive, but they're like, really psyched to get it. And we, our fall sport season ends October 24th and boys basketball practice begins the week of October 27th. And the girls go after that and then it starts indoor track in February. And that's about it. <laughs> we want to welcome you, Sarah and Chelsea. Uh, thank the you. first meeting is always the hardest. <laughs> And uh, we thank you for your nice report. Yeah. And we will get, I think, our names to principal <coughs> about oh. arranging a time yeah. to visit. Okay. okay. We thank nice. you for the invitation. Thank you. Okay. okay. The next item is communications. Superintendent, have any communication? Yeah. Did you want to recognize Sarah? Franklin? I'm going to do that under my. Okay. Um, under communications, I think Kevin might want to comment on his first PAS meeting, September 25th. Thank you, Trello. Uh, I recently had an opportunity to visit the Portland Arts and Technology High School as a member of the General Advisory Committee there. I must say I had an extraordinarily pleasant day and I was very surprised at the high quality of the programs and the infrastructure in that school. Apparently, we now have 25 CAPE students who are attending various programs there. I also had an opportunity, which I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, in having lunch with two of the CAPE students who attend uh, PASS on, uh, in two different programs, Jordan Gower and Arius Caron. And they both expressed to me and shared with me their plans to continue their education which seems to indicate that a uh, technology education and a college education are not mutually exclusive. And I would strongly recommend to uh, our students that they take a look at these programs and get with their guidance departments and see if there is an opportunity for them there. It was, again, a, it was an extraordinarily positive day and uh, I'm glad I'm involved with this program. When I came on the board we had eight students attending uh, what was then Portland Regional Technical High School. This year I believe we have 25. So in seven, seven years we've had that much growth and interest to meet the needs of a lot of our students. Um, next under communications, um, there's been considerable discussion and uh, telephone calls about the kindergarten situation and I think it's appropriate under communications that there's a um, a recommendation for uh, the next step in this process and I'm going to uh, yield to George. <clears throat> yes, um, uh, w there has been considerable discussion and it's great to see uh, the energy and advocacy level of the parents of uh, the kindergarten group um, I know in my own discussions with them, I've uh, counseled them about uh, following through a, an appropriate process to, uh, to have their 
issues heard and, uh, and perhaps re get some resolution to their issue. Uh, we've had a bit of a discussion a little bit earlier, and my recommendation is that uh, we convene a meeting uh, with uh, perhaps uh, Kathy Perkins and a few other um, parents, uh, so that there would be perhaps three or four parents, the superintendent, um, the principal of the school, the kindergarten teachers, and uh, a school board member, and I would volunteer to be that member. And the purpose would really be, I think we've heard the discussion, we've heard the issues. Uh, the purpose would really be to see whether or not um, a review of the situation uh, would result in a feasible proposal that uh, might be then brought forward to the, uh, the whole school board. Um, it seems to have gone from the, the principal level uh, more recently to the superintendent level. And this would, this would be really kind of a, a bit of a steering committee to come up with um, or evaluate whether or not there is a feasible proposal to bring forward uh, that the whole board um, would need to look at. I think that uh, perhaps that could be uh, coordinated uh, th through the superintendent's office. And, um, and we would hope to do that uh, sooner rather than later. Sometime during October. Sometime during October. In preparation for the November board meeting. And if there then is any proposal for the board, uh, they could uh, review that at the November board meeting. There was some discussion of using our November um, workshop as part of that time. We just felt that we needed to address this issue before that time, at, that we did not want it to fester until that time, and it needed to really be addressed and some kind of solution worked out or proposal, if there is a proposal, um, and what, what the next step of the process is. Uh, because our schedule is so full between now and that November workshop, we felt this was a better solution for at least starting to address those concerns. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Could you Problem. come to the podium and state your name and... On behalf of the parents of the kindergarten, the class of 2010, I am grateful for your input and for your energy and for your time. We thank you. Um, I know in speaking um, to many, many parents um, and all of the members of the school board that I was up, able to get a hold of and um, uh, the administration that was willing to hear me, um, I know that um, there is a considerable problem here and I'm not going to get into it, we've all been there, but again, I thank you and I am i um, really anxious to get this process going and, you know, we'll do all that I can do in order to, to make that happen sooner than later. And again, I thank you all. We felt that this was, the, this was the better way of expediting the process than to wait till November. Well, as we've talked, I, I, think, that, um, I think that the parents need to be heard. Um, obviously, you are listening to them via your phone calls. Um, but I think you're right. I think that we need to um, make this this happen and I am satisfied with that and like I said I will um, uh, we will we'll work from there so thank you very much appreciate it on behalf of all the parents that showed up tonight thank you very much for all of the parents that made five phone calls today thank you very very much so that is the will of the board that we proceed in this process it is under communications, I have one, one more communication. Uh, it's been a recommendation of our Nelms Middle School review process that we have a board representative on that committee, and I'm appointing Kevin Sweeney to be that representative. So it's official now, even though it's kind of unofficial. <laughs> okay, any other communications? Okay, we now move on to the superintendent's report. I want to recognize the fact that Sarah, <coughs> who is a high school teacher, was named the speech coach of the year for the state of Maine, and I think this is a great honor and we appreciate having her on our faculty. I also wanted to move on to uh, some reports on sabbatical leaves. We did have two teachers who were on sabbatical this past year, Paige Brown, who was in France, and Buddy Earl, who was in New Zealand. And we'd like each of them to perhaps give us a few minutes summary of their year's experience. Good 
Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here. It's nice to be able to share a little bit of my experience from last year. Um, last year, I was fortunate enough to have been selected to live and work in France as a Fulbright Exchange teacher. I taught English, which seems like quite an easy task, but in reality, when you're standing there faced with 30 young native French speakers, it quickly turns into quite a challenging endeavor. I worked in a college or middle school in a town called Sifour, located roughly between Marseille and Nice in the south of France. I had 160 middle school students, three classes of sixième, which is sixth grade, two classes of cinquième, eighth grade, and one class of troisième, the equivalent of ninth grade. I also worked two times per week in the local elementary school, also teaching English. For these students, however, this experience was their first exposure to English as a second language. As you can guess, the, uh, these elements came together to create what was, for me, one of the most enriching, rewarding, exciting, and challenging years of my life. Tonight, I've been asked to talk about my overall experience abroad, how it impacts what I teach here in Cape Elizabeth, and ways in which it relates to our foreign language curriculum. First, let me say how grateful I am to have had this opportunity. As a teacher of French, total immersion in the language and culture has proven to be invaluable and powerful, oftentimes difficult to quantify or even explain. The following list highlights some of the things that come to mind as I reflect back on my year. Besides the obvious advantages of becoming more proficient in French, I also learned a lot in other more subtle areas related to language and culture, which only happens when one lives day in, day out in a foreign place for an extended period of time. I learned more about French art, music, culinary and fashion trends, common values and attitudes in France, modern French expressions and colloquial colloquialisms, holiday traditions, the reputation of Americans abroad, ways to effectively communicate in a variety of situations, such as at the bank, in the post office, airport, gas station, restaurant, bakery, etc., and anything else you can imagine in any other situation. New places in, I learned about new places and cities in France and also in Europe. General ways of life, including school, family, and business procedures. And finally, I learned more about society, societal expectations of behavior, and ideas about interpersonal relationships on all levels. All of this firsthand knowledge is useful and will be integrated in my classes via student teacher discussions, use of visuals, implementation of authentic documents such as menus, tickets, receipts, and other realia sent back from France. In fact, I had about six to seven boxes full of stuff that I had to send back. I couldn't carry on the plane with me. And of course, other ways in which I will be able to implement all of this material will be through our curriculum design at the middle school. My experiences will enhance imaginary student trips to French-speaking countries, role play situations, and cultural activities, which all take place in the classroom. Actual photographs, souvenirs, and factual descriptions of different events make the foreign language learning experience more in-depth and effective for our students. Furthermore, I now feel better equipped to carry out and further develop our proficiency-based philosophy of teaching foreign languages. There are as many examples of ways students benefit from this exchange as there are student questions concerning the language and culture. From big to small, significant to insignificant, Something usually happens throughout the course of the school day which sparks a personal thought or leads to further shared information with students related to last year. There's been so much evidence of not only how much I've grown as a teacher, but also how, how my students have become beneficiaries of this global experience. Overall, I feel better qualified to not only answer, but to elaborate on student questions in a more power-packed, interesting way. This year, I've been asked a lot of questions, some seemingly very basic, such as, why do they drive smaller cars? Or, why are scooters so popular in southern France? 
Even common everyday issues which are of major concern in the adolescent mind can lead to fantastic conversations. For example, one question has been, do they have as much homework as we do? <laughs> or in the school, could you eat pizza for lunch? Knowing that their teacher has lived the experience obviously instills respect, and as a result, even when the topic seems mundane, conversations tend to lead to more lively, thought-provoking study. Other more specific examples are in relation to what we are currently studying in, in the eighth grade. Our unit title is Entertainment. Not only could I now list the various forms of entertainment in parts of France, but I could explain how to play certain games, such as something called boule, so that one day they might actually give it a try. I am able to give times and names of different TV shows as well as channels and important current events recently in the news in France. The possibilities are endless as more options are made available for our student projects. We will listen to popular music, read actual movie reviews, talk about what the current cost is to see a movie, or even discuss whether or not one has the option to eat buttered popcorn in French theaters. Uh, and some they do, some they don't. Other units which I'm excited about due to new ideas and information gathered abroad include vacations and travel, favorite foods, the fugitive, and everyday life. In conclusion, I would like to mention that none of this would have been possible without the support of my administrators and colleagues at Cape Elizabeth Middle School, especially the foreign language team of teachers. As challenging as some days were for me, I also realized the work and efforts that were put forth in our building to make this exchange as successful as possible. Nancy Hutton, Phil Jewett, and Suzanne Janelle should especially be commended for, for all of their very, very hard work. I wish to thank the board for supporting this type of leave. In doing so, teachers are allowed to be lifelong learners and set good examples. I appreciate having the opportunity to learn and grow with my students, both in France and here in Cape Elizabeth. If you want to know the right way up the mountain, you ask someone who has been there. As a result of this Fulbright Teacher Exchange Program, I am eager to share such valuable first-hand knowledge in an infinite number of ways with my students as we head up that sometimes overwhelming mountain called life and learning. One final indicator of the benefits in my classes from this exchange, an indicator which to me is noteworthy, is the fact that students show daily interest and motivation and are thus increasingly productive, successful, and happy learners. Thank you very much. Any questions? Sorry. <laughs> any, qu any questions? <laughs> what did your French, what was the most often asked questions of your French students of America? Oh, that's very difficult. Um, they asked if we all had big cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, they asked if we had the same types of schedules, business schedules, uh, school schedule, which we absolutely do not. <clears throat> For example, in France, um, their lunch period is between 12 and 1.30. Um, each student has a different schedule as well as each and every teacher. One teacher may go in on Monday, Tuesday, not on Wednesday, Thursday, and maybe a long day on Friday, whereas another teacher may have a completely different schedule. It's almost as if, um, as if it's at a in a university setting where the professor comes in, teaches the class, and leaves when that duty is done. And it, it's the same with the students. When they don't have class, they stay home. And so it's very, very different. There aren't many um, out of school or sp sports uh, co-curricular activities. It's, it's just school and academics, basically, which was very different for me. But I found that I could concentrate entirely on my classes that way. And teaching English, as I said, was much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Because as a native speaker, I remember that first week so well, it, it's, it's just, oh, oh no, where do I begin? And these students were very early on in their learning of English. So I had to pull back a little bit and break it down, um, which is something that I know already in French because 
I um, worked very hard for many, many, many years and still have to work very hard um, to speak and be prof proficient in French. So I already know what that breakdown was um, in French, but I didn't know how to do that f quite so well in English, teaching English. I would welcome any questions at any time. Um, for me, sometimes it's hard to, um, it, the experience has come and gone, and I am back in the routine here. And um, I think that people would like to ask questions a lot of times, my colleagues, my principal, but we all have so much going on right now that a lot of things get lost. But I appreciate this opportunity to share at least a little bit. It's it's very hard to do that in five minutes when you are <laughs> when you were there for almost a year to sum it up. But I tried to do as much as I could. You did a very good job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paige. Mr. Earl. Can you all see this at all? One way or another, one group is going to miss out. Um, kia ora, everyone. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Buddy Earl. I've been a fifth grade teacher here for a few years. Uh, bear with me. Um, Paige said in, in, in five or ten minutes it's very hard to wrap up what you did in a year. Uh, and there are two things that I'd like people to realize that this turned out to be the most significant year uh, that my family and I have spent together, and this is the short version. <laughs> um, in order to understand what happened to me and us in, in New Zealand, you have to understand New Zealand a little bit. So that's what I wanted to start with. Uh, New Zealand is also known as Aotearoa, which in the Maori language means land of the long white cloud. Uh, according to their legends, when the seven native canoes first found New Zealand, uh, they first found a, a long white cloud and the island was underneath it. Um, when we went, one of the first things I was told was that there were three and a half million people and 70 million sheep. Uh, as it turned out, that was about right. The figures have been a little bit changed. There are only 50 million sheep now uh, and closer to four million people. New Zealand is a land, though, that, that had everything. Uh, from volcanoes, beaches, glaciers, the Kiwis, fjords. Um, because of the international date line and also crossing the equator, it will be the first country to see the year 2000. Um, they've already started planning big celebrations for that. Um, what amazed me, or one of the things that amazed me, was having been across the United States, traveling days upon end to see the Rockies, uh, in the course of about 14 hours, you could traverse the two islands in New Zealand and see from the tip of the North Island, bananas growing. We had lemon trees in our backyard down to the southern tip of the South Island, uh, which is the staging area for Antarctica. Uh, and, and what they call the Southern Alps, which to me were very much like the Rockies, um, never having been to Europe, but the snow-capped mountains. Uh, and the scenery was just incredible. Uh, drives that every 60 seconds or so, you'd want to stop and say, let's pull over, we need to take another picture. Uh, we ended up taking 28 rolls of film, uh, seven hour and a half videos, uh, and still left out half of the things that we thought we should have, should have seen. New Zealand icons, uh, some of which we know, Kiwis, uh, the silver fern is an actual fern there. It's also the icon of most of their national sports teams. Uh, rugby ruled, it was the only sport. Uh, cricket lasted five days and after watching one of those, that was the end of it, and no more. Uh, fish and chips were big. The, the overall Kiwi attitude was, let's give it a go. So if something broke down in your home, uh, a car, things that may be here, we, we hire someone, we take the car into the garage, their attitude was, we can do something with this, uh, we'll give it a go, we'll give it a try. Uh, it was very, very refreshing. Um, obviously, there were sheep everywhere. The All Blacks are their national rugby team. Uh, and like here, where children, kids know, basketball players. Um, one of the big questions there was, do you know Mike Jordan? 
uh, do you know, you know half of the, the big football players and having to tell them that I didn't was uh, real disappointing. But every, every school child in, in New Zealand knows every single one of the rugby players, knows all the statistics about them. Uh, they're almost idolized, but they do an awful lot of community service. The All Blacks, which are the epitome of professional sport, actually go into the schools. Um, and on every level, there were rugby players, cricket players that would come into the schools, uh, talk about health issues, drug issues, uh, and things like that. And, and again, it was real beneficial for the kids. New Zealand schools, uh, obviously very different setups than what we know here. Uh, kindergarten, what we would call kindergarten, their preschool were ages three to four. Primary school was what I taught in. Uh, new entrants, new entrants, excuse me, enter at age five, and they enter the day after their fifth birthday. And if there are two days of school left, the kids go for two days of school, um, which seemed amazing. There were very few middle schools. It was just, it was an up and coming thing. Uh, up and through the, what would be our seventh grade, teachers were all self-contained, uh, which meant you taught art, phys ed, music, along with all the academic subjects. Um, having no artistic ability, and, and those that know me knowing I can't sing a note, uh, it was a real stretch to do some of those things. Uh, the other thing, I had to teach Maori, which is the second language, and the Maori culture, in some ways very similar to our Native Americans, but totally integrated into the community. Uh, doctors, lawyers, from the, the gamut, one end to the other, uh, the Maoris were part of that culture, very well accepted. Uh, teaching Maori, again, was another real challenge. Uh, we read a lot of stories, we come to town a lot, we learned all the colors two or three times. Uh, but I had a lot of people that supported me, so it was great. Uh, another part of the whole Kiwi attitude is people really, really cared about each other. Uh, in, we had morning tea every morning, which I thought was very civilized, uh, at 10.30. But instead of it being a faculty tea, uh, the custodian somewhere else doing their thing, secretary, it was everyone. And everyone seemed to care about everyone. Uh, we heard stories of people breaking down and a woman would come out of the house and say, my husband can fix that car. But while he's doing that, come on in and have dinner. And, and these are people, obviously, that you never met. And, and this was true. So those types of things were, were real eye-openers for us. Uh, what they called college is our high school, but it's a five-year high school. So it went through what would be our eighth grade up and through uh, 12th year of high school. Many, many students, though, left after their junior year. Um, got into businesses. Some even started their own. And it very much based on the British system uh, where the tests would happen at the end of certain years. And those tests made, if you passed the test, you kept going. If you didn't, that was pretty much the end of it and you did either go into business uh, or do some other things. New Zealand had a, had a whole bunch of firsts that, that bothered us in, in many ways. Um, it's first in the world in teenage suicides. And, and part of one of my theories is that part of it is based on that if you pass this test, you go on. If you do not pass this test, that pretty much is the end of your education. Uh, it's also first in skin cancer. There were, there were three or four real negative firsts that, that New Zealand was involved in that, that amazed us too. Um, four or five universities, um, having visited them, uh, felt they were very, very well qualified. Um, later on, I, I found out there were at least two Former Cape students, either there now or have been, uh, Trip Carter uh, went there for a semester from Bowdoin, and I think Matt Dransfield is there right now. Uh, I saw his mom not too long ago. So there was a, a connection there. Uh, one of the things that, that happens there is that you can shop for your high school. You don't do it by geographical location. Um, my whole family went, we have two teenagers, and Kathy, my wife, and the kids pretty much shopped around. And they found a high school that seemed typical to what we were used to. Uh, we live in Falmouth. Um, and they entered there. There were quota systems so that you could be told that you, that high school was filled. Um, but you did not do it by geographical location. 
uh, schools were not funded uh, by taxpayers' dollars but through a ministry. Um, so where you lived really had no bearing on where your kids might want to go to school. And different schools had different reputations for being, having strengths in different areas. Um, so that was very, very different. We were told from the start that there was a hierarchy uh, of education, that if we wanted the absolute best schools for our children, the single-sex private schools would be the way to go. Um, we had made up our minds before we left that uh, I have a son and daughter that, that they wanted to go to school together. Um, and they ended up going to a 1,500 student public education high school um, that was co-ed. And in my own eyes, uh, received a, a, an excellent education. Uh, a lot of differences. Um, one of the things, seeing some coaches, uh, people involved in athletics, um, was the difference between our athletics and, and theirs. Uh, varsity sports, there'd be one practice a week. There might be one training session, but one practice a week. Club sports that men on weekends got the best coaching, uh, and there were some incredible athletes. Um, I saw a basketball team that individually were probably better than any students I've seen in Maine. But Cape High School, Falmouth High School, really any of the schools in the area would have beaten them hands down because there was no team. There were five very gifted individuals out there who had no team concept. Um, so that, again, uh, real eye-openers. Um, school calendar, quite different, obviously, the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere. School began uh, the beginning of February. They were broken into four 10-week academic units with two weeks off in between. Uh, and I know as, as a parent and as teachers, we've talked a lot about retention and what happens over a summer and where the kids uh, tend to forget things and at different ages. Um, I found this real workable. Um, of course, you have to remember, too, that the seasons are very, very different. Uh, we did see one frost, and we're really shocked to see that one morning, uh, right in the middle of July especially. Uh, so the fact that, that here in Maine we have a 10-week break in the summer uh, still seems real natural to me and, and really the way it should be. Uh, whereas there, having 10 weeks, two weeks off, and having six weeks over the Christmas holidays, which is really the middle of their summer. Um, people spend Christmas Day at the beach. Uh, very traditional to have your, your barbecue because it's too hot to cook in the house. Uh, so again, some real differences there. Six weeks, um, again, for a summer ho holiday and two weeks off in between the others. Uh, a school day. Now, I was in a primary school, which again, was grades, what we would call kindergarten up through Form 2, which is roughly seventh grade. Uh, the first five months I was there, um, I instructed a Form 2 class, which would be roughly seventh graders, uh, some eight. Uh, and it was also the first time I had, had taught teenagers, and that too was very eye-opening. Uh, average class size, I'm sure I've got some down here somewhere, um, will probably make you feel good because the average class size was about 33. Um, and I know that probably you get a lot of talk uh, from different people about class sizes, and I know uh, it's an issue we're, we're dealing with in Falmouth right now. Um, so any teachers that complain, I, I just tell them this now, that I had 33 children, both terms that I taught, uh, and had to teach everything, from art, phys ed, music. Uh, but there are some cultural differences, too, that, that really made it easier. Uh, I mentioned morning tea, very civilized, 10.30 every morning. Uh, on Friday mornings, three or four teachers would bring in uh, some goodies. Uh, there was a teddy bear that was passed around so that if Keith had had a bad week, Keith might get the teddy bear this week. <laughs> Next week Keith would give the teddy bear to someone else. Uh, there was also a little mirror in case you had really done something wrong. So Phil might get it this week and the week after. But, uh, <laughs> again, real civilized and, and really uh, brought things down to a different level. And, and I've told this story uh, to Nancy and to some of the people I teach with. Um, at the end of my first week there, the teachers gathered in the, uh, in the teacher's room to kind of put your feet up and, and sit back and relax and talk. And the principal walked in and opened the refrigerator door and said, would you like white wine or red wine today or would you like a beer? 
And it was very culturally accepted, both by parents, there were children on the playground, around the building, um, and there were no connotations that this was something that shouldn't be done. Um, I'm sure New Zealand has its alcoholics and, and other problems, um, but culturally that, was an, culturally that was another big difference. And uh, having two teenagers, uh, we talked about that a lot, whether it was similar to what they face here and, and so on. And, uh, I could do a whole other recitation on that. Um, lunch, as Paige said, lasted from 12.30 to 1.30. School ended at about 3 o'clock. Um, the average time teaching is very similar to what you would find here, uh, but broken up in different ways. There was physical fitness every single day in the primary grades. Uh, and again, the teacher, there were no specialists. So uh, again, very, very different. Um, national curriculums, very similar to the main curriculums that have come out. Outcome-based, just as Maine is. Um, I have all those. I brought a huge box of books, but I know with, with the time frame being what it is, um, but those are things, too, at some time someone might want to share. Uh, the national curriculums were quite well written um, and worked for New Zealand because of its size, because of the culture, uh, worked very well. Would they work here? I really don't think so. Uh, I think we have strengths. Uh, we need some of the differences that we have in our education uh, to try and make it even statewide. I know has been a real chore over these, these last years trying to come up with outcome-based education. They've done it on a national level. Uh, one of my goals was to become fully certified to teach in New Zealand. I did go through a nine-month uh, period, and I am now fully certified to teach. And it was. Uh, it was very difficult because a good part of it was based on that national curriculum. Class sizes again, quite large. Uh, kindergarten, 17 to 25, and then beyond that, 33 was the average. Outcomes. Um, again, one of my own goals was to become certified to teach, to try and use that national uh, curriculum in a teaching situation, uh, which I did get to do. Uh, we're still connected now to education in and around Auckland. Uh, we started pen pals. Uh, we actually sent videos from the class I was teaching back there to uh, Pond Cove and the middle school here. We brought back uh, almost an entire um, music unit uh, of the Maori music. Um, we brought back some physical education programs, uh, a lot about the Maori art, a lot of the cultural things. Uh, one of my frustrations now, and Paige alluded to this, that there isn't enough time in the school day to do all the things that I gained in New Zealand and want to try now and give to the kids. Uh, there just isn't enough time. Uh, and it's not that I want two or three more hours of school, it's just uh, the way that, that our, our programs are built. Uh, the big things, I guess, for outcomes, too, um, I have a, the school that I was in back there. To give myself a, a little pat on the back, we did an outstanding job representing both Falmouth and Cape Elizabeth. And there are schools there that would very much be interested in having Cape Elizabeth as a sister city, town, uh, and even to the extent of doing some sort of a teacher exchange at some point. And obviously those types of decisions aren't up to me, but I would like to leave that thought with you. Um, it was very difficult because of the hemisphere change and the school calendar to smoothly fit in. Uh, the transition was incredibly easy for us because of the people there and the way that they accepted us, not just as a teacher, but as a family. Um, the respect for teachers there was incredible. Um, leaving was one of the most difficult things my family's had to do, and I've told other people that uh, if it were not for my daughter graduating this year and having promised her that uh, she should and could graduate with the kids she grew up with, I most likely would have sent a letter to you asking for an unpaid leave of absence for this year and would have stayed uh, because it was that remarkable an experience uh, as a teacher, as a human being, uh, and as a family. And because of that, too, I would like to thank all those people that, that were involved in supporting this move. 
uh, had lots of relatives who thought we were absolutely crazy. Uh, Nancy and Phil, the people in, in the middle school building, uh, Connie Ham uh, was incredibly supportive, and Mary and all the things that I had, Mary had to do to get me ready to go. Uh, the paperwork alone took about seven months. Uh, I think one of the things I'll do if I ever retire is, is write this all up and sell it to anyone else that would like to go away and do this. Because the red tape, uh, the number of hoops you have to jump through uh, is incredible. When we got there, uh, complaining a little bit about getting a green card, so to speak, in New Zealand, uh, was told right away, don't ever, ever talk about how difficult it is to get a green card in New Zealand because it's four times as hard to get one in the United States. So it made some great, great debates. Uh, <laughs> if I could leave you with anything, again, it, it would be the fact that there are a couple of towns there in New Zealand that would very, be very interested in a teacher exchange. We're still in the process now of faxing some class lists from the middle school back there uh, for kids to do what we now call keyboard pals because they're going to be using computers rather than writing longhand letters, although we'll probably do both. Uh, I'm hoping with the technology that we're in the process of getting uh, to be able to put together something that might be called This is Cape Elizabeth, uh, using still digital photographs. Uh, we should at some point also get the capability of sending video pictures uh, via ENA uh, and do a This is Cape Elizabeth uh, to send back there and have them do one uh, very similar. Um, I left you all with a, a little Kiwi quiz. Um, hope you take it at your leisure. Mary is the only one that has the answers. You have to put it right together. <laughs> That's because I helped him so much to get ready to go. But again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to principal's reports in the middle school. Nancy. Thank you, Pete. <clears throat> well, I think I'll just let Buddy and Paige say it for us and sit down. Um, I do have a couple of things, though. In addition, we received notice the first part of October from the President's Challenge Group, and that's a group that we now belong to for physical fitness. And <clears throat> we received the following notice. The President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports and the President's Challenge Administrator are pleased to announce that your school is the 1996-97 state champion award winner for your state in Category 3. As the landmark 1996 Surgeon General's Report on Physical Activity and Health indicates, regular participation in moderate physical activity is important in the lives of all Americans. We applaud your commitment to this effort and your leadership role in depicting an exemplary physical activity fitness role model, as well as hope that you will extend your zest for a healthy and fit lifestyle to your community at large. And Anine Burgess and Andy Strout received that letter. And then following, actually it came later, it was dated before we got this letter, but it arrived later, from Congressman Baldarchi. We received the following letter that was addressed to me. Please accept my congratulations on your accomplishment in attaining the State Champion Award. Due to your dedication to excellence in physical fitness, your students scored at or above the 85th percentile on the President's Challenge. As I am sure you are aware, this award is quite an honor, one which you clearly deserve. At a time when many schools are moving away from focusing on physical fitness, your school's success provides a fine example for others to follow. Your students' achievement is a source of pride for Cape Elizabeth and the state of Maine. Again, congratulations on being recognized by the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports for your school's excellent overall performance in the President's Challenge. Sincerely, Johnny e. Baldarchi, Member of Congress. So compliments to um, Andy and Anine for the fine program that they organized throughout the four years of the students' participation at the middle school. And of course, they build on what has, was started at Pond Cove and send them on to the high school physically fit and ready for more. So congratulations to all the students. I was um, mentioning this to our stu to, um, student council members and um, Sarah was really excited because she said, oh, I got one of those badges. And uh, so they are quite proud of their accomplishment and certainly congratulate them. A couple of things just to update you on. Our NELMS review continues to move forward. 
it's this is the second week in a row I haven't found out a new job we needed to do for the Nelms review so it's it's pretty pleasing uh, we are moving forward with our staff survey which Nelms provide us with provides us with we have developed with some samples they sent us in our own um, contributions to that a parent survey and a student survey and those two drafts will be finalized next week at our meeting then we'll collect that information and we need to collect the information tabulate it write a report and send that off and our goal is to have that in the mail by mid-December to have all of those things for NELMS and then they will come forth and do their review we hope in the latter part of January and the first of February um, we thank Kevin for his attendance on an informal basis and from tonight forward I understand he will be our formal representative from the school board and we also have two parents Jean Curran, Curran and Ann Swift Kayata who have joined us on our steering committee the other members of our steering committee are the members of our team leadership team we also continue to move forward with our outdoor experience task force we refer to it as outdoor experience because it is outside of the classroom walls. On October 21st, we are taking a work day to have people come and do some presentations to us from different providers. Um, by the end of that day, we hope to have a proposal and plan to have a proposal to take to the middle school staff meeting that day and have people vote on that. I have been to um, the seventh and eighth grade team meetings to check out commitment and we have people who have some further questions but the overall majority is very committed to doing something like this the fifth grade was very excited about it and the sixth grade has had an out of the classroom experience for the last several years the providers that will be presenting to us and we've asked them to come and do a 15 to 20 minute presentation on what they could do for us we're going to hear providers from USM and their project at Wolf's Neck which is a physical challenge course the Maine Conservation School which is located in Bryant Pond Chewankee Camp Ketcha which is just down the road from us and Camp Kiev which is uh, both Chewankee and Kiev also the Maine Conservation School will do things on their own sites but also back at our school sites as well we have further information to add to our proposals from L.L. Bean and an orienteering program that they do with mapping and also with the state parks in Cape Elizabeth. Those people won't be presenting. We do have information from them. And we have, I've been in touch with some other um, programs that haven't been able to get back to us on the phone um, to just get some more information over the phone as we make our decisions. But we do look forward to making a report to the school board at your November 12th meeting, as I believe was the direction last June when we were given the task of forming the committee. For any parents who are watching tonight or students, we did get our pictures back today uh, for this year, our picture makeup day. And the quick look over the pictures is we have a few people who will want to have those made up, um, as well as a few people who were unable to have their picture taken that day due to absence will be on October 30th in the morning and everything else other pictures people will go home tomorrow and be delighted with them and have those we have our curriculum work is beginning and that's our focus of looking at our curriculums taking um, the syllabi that we developed and shared with you we're going to be linking those to the main learning results uh, coming up with revisions looking where gaps are, how we can combine some assignments, working on local assessments, and coming up with revised and renewed syllabi for the 98-99 school year. And we will begin those on October 20th. And we hope to have our work for this year done pretty much with those prior to the April break, right around April 13th. But we have a schedule of meetings. And every member of the middle school staff will be on one of those curriculum meetings. And we we're asking grade levels to be represented. Just an announcement, I forgot to share this with Sarah and Chelsea, that the eighth graders will be taking the MEAs the week of October 27th in the morning. We are sending a reminder home with our progress reports for eighth grade families um, to be reminded of that effort. And we are also instructing all of our students this year to be sure to answer the questions thoroughly and carefully. As an item analysis of last year's performance indicated, we needed to work better on that. As I was going over this report, um, right at the end of school today with Phil he wanted me to share with you that coming off a board workshop we had last year about how to assistant principals spend their days he's still finding plenty to do and keeping busy 
but he's glad to report as our third year into the building, he is spending far less time on maintenance issues um, this year. His hammer, he still knows where it is, but it might get just a little bit rusty this year as things seem to be well under control and the building moves forward. We always say that cautiously. With every new rainstorm, we find a few new leaks, but we're working on those and uh, we'll continue to look for improvement. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, we move on to the high school, and Peter. I'd like to first commend our SAC uh, group both for the uh, content and the substance of their presentation. I think it's an initiative that I was very pleased to see them taking. They've uh, uh, put a, a heavy agenda in front of uh, themselves, but I think their uh, primary objective and, and one that's very uh, suitable is to uh, build bridges between the student body and the uh, school board, and I commend them for that. Uh, I think it's also a, a good time as the, uh, our fall uh, season comes to a close to uh, share with uh, you and in public um, my very favorable views of the um, extracurricular or co-curricular athletic program uh, that Cape Elizabeth uh, offers. I've been very impressed as we head into these final games with the, uh, uh, the work of our coaches, uh, the work of our students. They, they carry themselves well on the field. They've had uh, excellent results, but more importantly, uh, in my mind, uh, is the uh, way that they have carried themselves uh, on the field. And uh, I have uh, felt proud to be associated with them at all times. Uh, well done to both coaches and student athletes. The theme of most of the rest of uh, my report would be uh, parental communications. Uh, we had a, uh, what I uh, felt was a very successful open house in late September, uh, very well attended, and, uh, and the feedback that uh, we received was, uh, I thought, exceedingly positive, both regarding the presentations that were put on by teachers that evening, uh, but also uh, in terms of the education that uh, the parents felt their students are receiving uh, in the high school. It was uh, an affirming evening, I think, was, uh, would be a good way to uh, put it. I was, I was very pleased, as I said, with both the attendance and the comments that we received. Our next uh, evening of parent communication is, uh, is aimed at freshman parents, uh, but certainly any parents that are uh, listening uh, tonight are, are welcome. Uh, on next Monday, October 20th, uh, when we have a representative from uh, day one coming in to lead discussions on uh, how to communicate with your high school age student, uh, especially during the transition years, the transition from the middle school to the uh, high school. So as, as I say, it's uh, aimed at ninth grade parents, um, but certainly any parents uh, who are interested in communicating more effectively with their high school age students uh, would be welcome. Following that will be the uh, fall parent conferences. We've designed the timing uh, on those to try to give the greatest possible accessibility to our parent community. And so we've set up times that, that allow for three very different and distinct uh, time frames. And Thursday, November 6th in the evening, on Friday, November 7th in the afternoon, and on Monday, November 10th all morning. Uh, so that we're, we're hoping that parents uh, uh, with that combination of times will be able, all parents will be able to find a time that works for uh, them. We've already had strong sign up uh, for these uh, evenings uh, starting with the uh, open house uh, evening. Um, our our uh, curriculum work is centering right now on the question I, I think I mentioned at the last board meeting uh, and at this coming faculty meeting, the, the question that we will be um, working uh, on is does our program, does our curriculum and academic program meet the needs of the students uh, who are now attending Cape Elizabeth High School? Uh, we will be looking at that from all angles uh, for all ability levels uh, to see what's missing, if anything, and uh, if so, what do we do to fix it? I'm open for questions. 
Joe, I mean, the uh, what's the status on the trip to France that you discussed with us at the last meeting? How's that coming along? How many students have signed up? I don't know the, uh, I should have checked with that before I came. I, I will get that information. I, I don't know how many have signed up. I know David has sent the informational letter out with students, uh, but I don't know the status of the sign up at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And finally, Pond Cove and Tom. Good evening. I'll try to be brief. I know you have a lot of work to do tonight. Uh, you're going to take formal action later on the agenda on uh, teacher nominations, but I just wanted to give you a, a brief update on what's been going on. You know, we had a, a resignation uh, in second grade uh, three weeks ago now, I think, and we were fortunate enough, I think, to find an excellent candidate who uh, subbed this year and uh, was very successful with uh, you know, maintaining the standards, working with students, with parents, and with me. Uh, this uh, Susan Michaud has also, also subbed uh, quite a, a bit at Pond Cove in the past two years. I, I think we, as I told the parents, locked out on this one. The other re resignation was uh, Peg Lewis, who has left Pond Cove for an opportunity to be a reading specialist in the Portland schools. Um, I'm going to miss Peg. She was an outstanding educator for years at uh, Pond Cove and I think at the middle school. I think we have replaced half of Peg. That's the uh, special ed part. We're having a lot of difficulty recruiting a qualified person for the reading recovery half. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to poach a trained person and the deadline for getting somebody into the training is uh, just about over. If I'd known Buddy was available in New Zealand, we could have gotten somebody. That's where reading recovery started. So we're trying to be creative and flexible with that other uh, half of a position that Peg is leaving behind. The teacher um, presentations, uh, curriculum presentations, concluded its cycle recently. All the grades did it, and uh, as usual, it was a smash, I think. Uh, parents, it was well attended by parents, and the feedback has been excellent. I really want to commend the teachers. Uh, this is the third year I've been here for the amount of preparation they do. Uh, for the way they present themselves and the way they handle questions from the parents. Um, as a generic follow-up to that, we're going to offer a uh, parent's introduction to Chicago math Thursday night at 7 o'clock in the Pond Cove Library Media Center. So I've sent home notices and uh, I hope some people attend so they can get a bit more of an overview of the math program in Pond Cove. Math and science, I, I wish this were true. This, <laughs> as far as I know, this is uh, an, an error. It says that we got the big grant from the National Science Foundation. But it, it, uh, last time I called, we had not gotten the grant. Maybe uh, not, not we have not, not well, right. We haven't heard yet. Um, but there is good news with science. I, I mentioned a month ago that the math, main math and science um, association has reorganized itself somewhat. And they have a center representative to talk to me, Andy Vale from the Learning Center. And they're very interested in working with Cape Elizabeth, who has had the nerve to do a K through six FOSS uh, project. So our obligation would be to uh, work with them and to help document the results of the science program, something we were planning to do anyway. So my preference would be to pull together the um, so-called Science Curriculum Steering Committee, uh, meet with Andy and come up with a plan. Um, finally, uh, Gail Gibbons, the noted children's author and illustrator, was in Cape Elizabeth last week, invited by Shari Robinson. And as I understand it, uh, the morning uh, social time was very successful, and Gail generated a lot of enthusiasm and interest all day with every Pond Cove student. This is something that, that Shari does almost with, without uh, any attention given to her. And I just want to take the time to say anything that goes that smoothly was well prepared. And uh, I know she worked out the, any possible snags as it went along. Just to comment, this, the saga of the grant, big grant, continues yeah. because today Pauline had a phone call from one of our auditors who was already <coughs> concerned about the, how we're going to be reporting and how the documentation for this grant is going to occur. So he feels that we've gotten a grant. So. OK. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. And we could use the $3.5 million. Right. Any question? Thank you. We now move on to committee reports. The first is the Finance Subcommittee and George. I mean, I'm sorry. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
we met at 6.30 tonight, uh, the Finance Committee did. Uh, uh, first, I want to officially welcome uh, our new business manager, Pauline uh, Portria. That's the way to say it. Uh, we signed warrants and reviewed the appropriations report. Uh, we discussed uh, the guidelines for using the contingency account. And basically anything that's going to be spent uh, will come through the Finance Committee on the contingency account. Uh, we discussed the status of uh, the bus drivers and custodians uh, negotiations uh, for next year's uh, budget. Uh, we re reviewed the audit report, uh, which came out with no reportable conditions for uh, last year, which is a very good uh, condition. Uh, we discussed uh, the co-curricular fees, uh, which in new business, I believe there'll be a motion made to uh, increase and add some. And I believe that was, uh, there'll be a motion in new business also to transfer uh, an amount of money and close the uh, building account. Now we move on to the policy subcommittee from George. Uh, the policy subcommittee did meet on uh, September 10th and um, addressed uh, uh, three policies, the first of which was uh, promotion and retention of students, and uh, we revised that policy and it's prepared for a first reading this evening. Um, additionally, we addressed policy, um, the policy that has to do with suspension and expulsion of students, um, particularly um, uh, with regard to administrative guidelines for that policy, the, the, the how-to steps um, in terms of uh, some, some very specifics about uh, communications and so on. And uh, guidelines were developed and also are being presented for a first reading today, tonight. Uh, as well, uh, we began a discussion of uh, instructional time and time on task. Uh, this is a very sweeping policy uh, that really has a whole lot to do with uh, the calendar and instructional time and so on. And um, we will continue that discussion tomorrow um, when the policy subcommittee, uh, policy, policy subcommittee meets uh, at uh, 745 tomorrow in the council chambers. Um, and additionally, we will do a data review tomorrow of the uh, impact of the eligibility requirements, uh, the policy that was changed last year uh, with regard to athletic and co-curricular eligibility. That's it. Any question? Okay, we move on to unfinished business, <coughs> co-curricular fee committee report, and Kevin. Co-curricular committee is met to entertain the uh, requests of the middle school and the high school in terms of uh, additional funding. Um, in terms of the middle school, uh, the middle school requested a total increase of 45 hours, uh, 50 of those hours going to a new program in debate which would clearly indicate that Nancy and staff have juggled their figures and cut and pasted uh, throughout uh, in order to come up with uh, the time and minimize the, the effect of the increases. The committee has recommended that we um, accept the request for a debate team at a total of 50 hours with the net increase of 45 hours. At the high school level, there are three specific requests that have been recommended for, for approval. The first request is approximately 23 hours. I, I leave off the decimal points. Um, they've requested an increase from $585 to $800, which is approximately 22 plus hours, in order to more adequately fund a visiting artist uh, to work with the students, and the committee has recommended that that, ha that be approved. Um, there is a position in uh, journalism that did not exist before. The request was for 214 hours. However, I need to point out that this was formerly a co-taught position and uh, between the English department and I believe the technology department. 
And although it would not so appear in the co-curricular budget, there is a corresponding and more than offsetting saving in another budget area. Is that correct, Peter? And finally, there is the jazz band. The jazz bands have requested an increase from 106 hours to 400 hours, which is truly a significant increase. However, based on the uh, information presented, there has been a significant, significant increase in student interest and participation in this activity. The band has done very well. And again, the committee has recommended that we approve that increase. That is the end of the report, except to say that the Teachers Association is in concurrence with the recommendations. Okay, any questions? Could I have a motion? I would move that we accept the recommendations of the co-curricular committee, increasing the total hours for the middle school to 45, by 45 to allow a 50-hour debate team. And in the high school, a approximate 22 point some odd hour increase for the art club, a 214 hour increase for the new journalism position, and a 194 hour increase for the jazz bands. Do I have a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? <clears throat> Five zero. Thank you, Kevin. It was a, a lesson in on-the-job training by uh, Kevin. It, yes, it was. I think we'll do things a little differently <laughs> now that I think I know what I'm doing. Okay, we now move on to new business and versus consideration of teacher resignations. As Tom mentioned, we had two resignations from the Pond Cove staff. One was Peg Lewis, who has been a special education and reading recovery teacher, and the other is Wanda McCormick, who was an elementary teacher who has taken a position in Lewiston. Do I have a motion? Keith? I move we accept the uh, resignations as recommended by the superintendent. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I, I'm just hopeful that um, we're using every opportunity to conduct exit interviews, particularly with um, individuals who are, you know, uh, valued uh, staff members who are leaving. Um, we don't want to miss the opportunity to conduct an interview and, and, and learn from them uh, so that we can, uh, we can improve from uh, perhaps some suggestions that they might have for us. That has been a process the past well, year. Uh, <laughs> George did them the past year, right? Um, so with someone other than no. school board doing them. <laughs> no longer. There's no longer anyone on the school board doing them. That's correct. Of course, we would take a volunteer if someone wished to do it. Otherwise, I'm trying to squeeze that in along with lots of other things. But I do think they're important, so we'll try to continue. All those in favor? Five, zero. I have some nominations. Uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, Susan Michaud will be replacing um, Wanda Stallings McCormick as a second grade teacher and Susan has subbed for us and so she is a known quantity and she had a chance to sub prior to being um, selected as the, the nominee. I also have Karen Constance who will be an ESL teacher. This is an area where we continue to have uh, the numbers of students growing and so I wish to nominate her. I also have Mary Ann Neon and that is, this has just come forward today. She will do the half time special education piece, uh, that part of Peg Lewis's job. If you're willing to do that nomination at this time as well, we would like to have her start as soon as possible. She also has been subbing for us at the high school, so she is a known uh, entity. So if you can either do the three separately or together, whichever your wishes. <coughs> Everybody feel comfortable doing all? Do you have a motion? I'd make the motion that we accept the uh, superintendent's recommendations for the additional um, three new uh, staff members. Do you want me to specify who they are? Do you remember them? <laughs> I, I have one in front of me, so that would be an easy one. But um, Do you want to reread? Susan Michaud, grade two. Karen Constance, ESL. And the one that you have in front of you. Mary. Mary Nahan. Na Nahan. Nahan. 
Do I have a second? With special ed. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Now, this is not a nomination to a teaching position, but we also have hired, or actually hired on a contract basis, uh, an OT, Cinna Hunter, C I N N A Hunter, who will be an OT with us on for four days per week. No, five days a week. She's five days a week, sorry, five days a week. The previous one was four days. That's a week. right. Right, we had to increase it by a day, thanks. Who is that individual again? Her name is Cinna Hunter. Hunter. Do I have that? It should be in your packet. Should have had it in your packet. I have another, yeah. Looks like I have it. Got it? Okay. Yeah. You don't need to approve that. That's a contract. May I ask a question? Sure. Claire, what does that work out in hours as need or? Okay. The person that we had was four days a week, and we found that was not, he was not able to cover the needs of our students. Okay, sabbatical leave requests for 98, 99 school year. Right, I've had two requests for sabbatical leave. Uh, Jill Bell, who is a Pond Cove teacher, and Mary Ann Casey, who is a middle school teacher. And I recommend at this point in time that both of those be referred to the sabbatical subcommittee for development of a full proposal, which then would come back to the board at a later date. Do we have a motion? A move. A second? Second. Any Cer discussion? Certainly after having uh, listened to Paige and Buddy tonight, you realize the value of experiences such as that. And these are definitely experienced teachers requesting. Um, all those in favor? Five zero. So we, those are sent on to the sabbatical leave right. committee. Right, there is a board member on that committee. Yes, there is. Don't have my right. Moving on to the athletic fee positions. Uh, following nominations are people who are continuing the programs that they have coached in previous seasons. We have Jim Ray, boys varsity basketball. Tom Robinson, boys JV basketball. He had been the freshman coach last year. Kerry Curtis, Varsity Boys Swimming, and Kerry Curtis, Varsity Girls Swimming. Ben Raymond, Assistant Swimming. Harvey Wheeler, High School Diving. We also have John and Ann Upton, High School Nordic Skiing, and that's a volunteer position. At the middle school, we have Jerry McQueeny, Eighth Grade Boys Basketball. Creed Ray, Seventh Grade Boys Basketball. Those are continuing people. We have two new staff people. Kurt Brown as assistant ice hockey coach, and Stephen Willett as assistant ice hockey coach. While you're meditating, Keith, where are you at in terms of vacancies? Any vacancies at the moment? Just back on the minutes of the special meeting, there was a motion made and passed uh, in reference for an, uh, to fund an assistant coach for middle school boys soccer if money is available. Was money available and has that position been found? They weren't able to find anyone. Haven't found a candidate. We had the money, but not the person. Right, and the season's over, so just about. Thank you. So they all served on one team. That must have been interesting. <laughs> Any other questions? Entertain a motion. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for uh, returning and new coaches for winter sports at both the high school and middle school. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Moving on, co-curricular, uh, Lacey Goodrich to do the Fall Art Club at the high school. And then I have a list of co-curricular positions from the middle school. 
Lyle Kramer, Debate, Joanne Lee, Fifth and Sixth Grade Chorus, Joanne Lee, Talent Show, and Michelle Gagne and Nancy Scott, who will share the yearbook task. Entertain a motion. Move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for co-curricular positions as enumerated. Do I have a second, second, George? Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. I have a request for an unpaid leave for this spring from Sue Richmond, who wishes to have some time to climb Mount McKinley in Alaska, and that's the time of the year apparently when you do it. And I know Peter is here. Sue? There she is over there. I'm uh, here to answer any questions. Peter and Sue have worked on uh, working out the various uh, details of this and feel comfortable with, with what they're able to do. We realize it's the end of the school year, uh, but, but feel comfortable that the possibility is there. And I certainly recommend this. I think this, again, is an, a mind or a perception or whatever expanding experience that I think we need to support teachers in uh, participating in such activities. Susan, how long have you been in our system? Uh, this is my seventh year. I've my okay. tenth year. And Peter, what would be the plan to continue on Susan's curriculum during her leave? Uh, Sue would, would have uh, prepared uh, the labs and exams uh, that would be used for the remainder of the year with some flexibility by the substitute teacher if. Uh, uh, topics, you know, if a certain topic isn't covered and so forth, they would have the leeway to move that. But she has uh, talked with me about planning that time also in terms of grading. Uh, all grading up to that point would have been completed uh, with a formula for uh, percentage of uh, remaining grades uh, counting towards the final grade. I would join Dr. Mole's recommendation. I, I think this type of uh, experience is, is great for the teacher themselves, but I think it is also, I think one of the most important things that we can show our students is that we still maintain a passion for learning and a passion for experience, and this kind of experience I think would be, would fit right into that mold. And this is an unpaid leave. It's an unpaid leave. Okay. Any discussion, questions? Entertain a motion? I would move that we grant uh, Susan's request for an unpaid leave of absence. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. And this is not until spring, so certainly if issues or concerns come up in the meantime, we'll have ample time to discuss them with Sue. And you'll come back and share those with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Okay, um, policies for first reading, George. Uh, this evening we have uh, two, actually one policy and one set of guidelines that are being presented uh, for first reading. Uh, the first being um, policy IKE, <coughs> which is promotion and retention of students. This uh, policy has been revised um, essentially to read uh, that, the dis and this has to do with um, retaining or accelerating a student, uh, the decision to retain or accelerate a student will be based on the recommendation of the multidisciplinary team, and then uh, the revision was, however, the final decision is made by the building principal. The uh, second, uh, which is a set of administrative guidelines, is uh, guidelines pr uh, um, uh, developed essentially to aid uh, interpretation of the policy to provide a sequence and some clarity. And this uh, is for file JGD, uh, which has to do with student suspension and expulsion. Um, and these are brand new guide guidelines. So what you see in front of you um, has not been um, uh, in print before. Under Administrative guidelines D, is this a common practice about um, ex, uh, clearing, a, clearing a student's record? Yes. Um, 
uh, the question that's being asked has to do with uh, an expulsion being recorded on the permanent record um, and after one year from the date of re-entry, if the student successfully re-enters, the student and or his parent or guardian may request that the record be expunged, basically, that it, it, um, it be uh, removed from the record. But it's not mandatory. It's, a re it's just a request, it would, right. And that is a request to the superintendent who can uh, comply with that or uh, approve that request or uh, if there's some reasons why, um, deny that request. Charlie? Yes. Is it uh, required or necessary to have a legal counsel review this to make sure we're in compliance with all state rules and, and regs in reference to this? Uh, this actually has come through the state association. We've just made some minor changes, so it was reviewed by their attorney. So it's actually. already been done. Okay, thank you. But it is a normal process for all our policies by the second reading to have, to have uh, met legal review. Right. I think, in fact, um, John, it was legal counsel who recommended that we put something like this in place because mm. we were we were struggling with some procedural pieces. I like E. The re-entry planning, I think that's quite specific. You might you want to read that? Okay. Or? To assist in re-entry planning, the superintendent will issue a letter to the parent guardian immediately following the hearing. This is an expulsion hearing. The letter will specify the process steps for re-entry and capture the board's sentiments about conditions to be satisfied to increase the board's likelihood of a favorable response on the re-entry request. We this year was the first time that we've had, since I've been on the board in going on nine years, that we had a re-entry request and we really had no process. Excuse me, Kelly? Yes. Uh, are these guidelines made available to the students in some type of a handbook or something that they can review and read when they first begin the school year so that they are aware of the, the process? In their, in, their student, in their student handbook, um, all of these pertinent policies are in there. So once this is passed, then it would then? It would be added yeah. the next, next year. The next time around, it would be going. Right. Well, by the, by the next time around, once it, if it were to be passed, would, would it, I don't understand. Well, I, I don't know what the next time it's published. Yes, it would definitely go in in the fall. I don't know whether you'd wish to at least communicate to the students the content of this for this year. You might want to do that in, through the student council or some way. If it becomes effective, they should know what the rules mm. are, right? Thank you. Okay, if there are any um, concerns or questions, uh, you can field those on to the policy subcommittee. And there will be a second reading in November. Charlie, you had a couple of things. Yes. First. Uh, in the middle section, uh, point B of, of this one, in the event that a student is withdrawn from expulsion or from enrollment prior to the expulsion hearing, a withdrawn prior to expulsion hearing notation will be entered into the student's permanent record. Uh, I have a couple of problems with that um, as to what happens if the student tries to re-enroll. Does, does, do they get pushed down to point E at the bottom? Uh, no, they would go. They, well, if, unless it was a long period of time, but if it was a fairly short period of time, they would go back to the point where you, we would schedule an expulsion hearing for them. Mm -hmm. Now, if four or five years had elapsed, you might want to reconsider that, but certainly if they were returning to the same school, in other words, if, they, if this had occurred in the middle school and it was three or four years later and they were entering the high school, you might want to make some adjustments to that. But basically, you would then go to a schedule an expulsion hearing. I also have a concern about that sentence, and it, it seems as though the perception might be that the student has gotten away with whatever the offense was that was going to warrant an expulsion hearing to begin with. Um, I, I have a hard time supporting this whole thing because of that, that line right there. Um, and I don't know if anyone else concurs with, with, with what I'm feeling about that. It, it, uh, it seems to take the right and responsibility away from the school board uh, especially in the fact-finding stages of the uh, of the expulsion hearings, I think it's our responsibility to find out what has gone on 
leading up to this expulsion hearing, and in the case of somebody simply withdrawing, uh, we never find out about it, basically. So I, I really have a big concern about that. Well, if, if you had reached the point where you had scheduled an expulsion hearing, you would know about that. Well, actually, uh, that hasn't been the case in the past. Uh, we've actually been, I've been told anyway that, that the school board members should not go into an expulsion hearing with any knowledge of the situation, basically. No, but in this, but, but you would know that there had been an expulsion hearing scheduled, and then we would have to tell you it was canceled. So at that point, you would know that this had occurred with a student, and then you could see, at that point we could divulge information because obviously no longer the student the student is no longer a student here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the other I think it's um, you know it's intended as a um, as a deterrent I suppose. Um, for people withdrawing a student and and thinking that uh, there's there is no repercussions for the fact that they've withdrawn a student pr just prior to an expulsion hearing, um, and that's the purpose of, of making the notation on the file was was again to to let the record reflect that the withdrawal was done um, at the time that a suspension here or a, an expulsion hearing was uh, was scheduled. Would you be any happier with that, Keith, if we added the sentence that sort of responds to your initial question, which was, if the student decides to re-enter, at that point he will be scheduled for an, he or she will be scheduled for an expulsion hearing? I mean, that makes that a little bit stronger. I'm not sure. It, it, uh, that would certainly address the first concern I had. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that, that would be fine. Uh, again, I'm... I'm afraid that if we don't carry through with the process, we don't get the opportunity to hear the school administration or, or uh, in superintendent uh, telling us about the situation. I, I, if there's no hearing, I, I don't think we're going to know about it. Except the legal opinion has been that we really can't have an expulsion hearing on a student who is no longer a student here. Or an expulsion hearing for somebody who doesn't show up at the hearing. <clears throat> but if, if clearly if they are no longer a student here, then it becomes a new point, basically. I'd like to suggest, uh, just in the interest of clarity, that we might add to be that a student's reentry is subject to a board hearing under those circumstances. Uh, and again, simply for clarity, uh, because that's what we have discussed. And as to the other issue, while I emotionally I agree with Keith, since we don't have subpoena powers, uh, and can force a student to come to a uh, a uh, an expulsion hearing. I think it's pretty much a moot point. Yeah, I disagree because I think it's our duty and responsibility to hear the facts of the case, whether at least on the prosecution side. Well, I, again, I don't disagree, but without the power to force an appearance, I don't know how we can do that. I think the only thing that we could do is if if there was a reentry and it was a, within a reasonable time that it's the language states that there would be a board hearing that the you know you've already earmarked the record with with a comment that they withdrew prior to expulsion hearing right now we have nothing that notes that and and we had an administrator who left in that school and the next succeeding administrator might not know that and somebody could re-enter. It's never happened, but it could happen. Sure. Okay. But I, I agree with you. I think there needs some added language about any kind of re-entry within a reasonable about, amount of time that it require a board hearing. John? I agree with you. Yeah, we can work on that language, John. Yeah. This will be back for the next meeting, the second meeting. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Okay, um, the next is an adjustment to our agenda, which is HJV and varsity field hockey athletic trip. And if Sue Weatherby would like to come forward, is she here? Yeah. And explain the rationale. It's a, it's a different request than we've ever had yes. before. Yes. So. Every year um, for the past 10 years, we have afforded the opportunity for our players to see high level play by attending a Division I game 
Um, in the past, that has been everything to a day trip um, to Boston to preview Northeastern BC BU um, to an overnight trip where we have stopped at UNH, watched a game in the afternoon on grass, gone to Boston, uh, spent the night, and then gone to a game on turf um, the following day and then returning home. Um, this year, <coughs> it didn't look like a trip was going to happen because of so many weekend commitments by the individual players. Uh, not only game commitments, but PSATs and SATs and holiday weekends and so forth, and it didn't look like it was going to happen. And then we received notification that the NCAA Final Four was in fact going to be in New England this year. Um, it is going to be at, Connecticut, at the University of Connecticut on November 21st and 23rd. Um, the semifinals occurring on the 21st. Um, the details are quite vague because that's all the NCAA has stated so far, is that the games, in fact, will be um, at the University of Connecticut. The semis will be on the 21st, a late afternoon and an evening game, and then the finals will be on Sunday. Um, in bringing that to our players, there were a lot of people very excited about the opportunity to take that trip. Um, our booster organization has helped to sponsor that trip in the past. Um, we have parents working on some of the details, and at this point, um, we would um, like the opportunity to proceed. Um, in taking the details that we had to Mr. Weatherby today, we found out that, in fact, that the coach's involvement um, could present, um, or does, in fact, present um, uh, against the MPA guidelines in terms of the sports season being over. It says that the coaches cannot have anything to do with the players beyond the sports season, which I think ends November 8th. So there is some difficulty um, in that. I'm not sure what we as coaches are allowed to do and what we aren't allowed to do. Um, so um, right now, I guess the parents can take the kids. We can take them and be responsible for them in the hotel, but we cannot take them to the game, is that correct? The parents would have to be responsible for them at the game. Um, I don't know how that's going to play out. We just got that information this afternoon. Certainly, we're not going to do anything that violates MPA guidelines. Um, I guess at this point, we're just looking at um, permission to go ahead and proceed and come back to you at a later date with the details. They'll miss one day of school? They won't miss any school. We would leave. A Friday? We would leave after school on leave Friday. After school. Transportation in the past, just so you know, has been anything from a school bus to a chartered bus to vans to parents also um, driving. Um, we understand that there are a great many parents that are interested in coming and, and previewing the, the NCAA Final Four games as well. Um, but we wanted to bring it to you early, even though we don't have all of the details. Any questions? So this is something that's been done. We've in the done past. it every year for the last ten years. Yes. But I've never seen it come before the board. Yes. Has it? It has always come before well, the board. Well, maybe it's because we haven't had the detail. You didn't have the form per se, um, but we have always brought you a narrative okay. about what we're doing. And it's just an opportunity for kids to see high-level play, something they could aspire to if they're looking into playing either Division Three or Division I uh, field hockey um, in college, an opportunity to see games on turf um, and just expose them to that high-level play. You may have said this, but how many students do you anticipate going? Well, probably about 40. 40, large group. Allie? Yes, John. So the whole thing is uh, in reference to the, to the transportation using town vehicles as opposed to if the parents went out and rented their own vans and put together their own uh, schedule, we'd have no involvement, they could do it on their own. Is that correct? That's well, if correct. our coaches are going, we If our coaches involved. are going, we can't be responsible for them at the game, but certainly we probably would have enough parent supervision that we could go to the game, it's just that we can't take them to the game. We can be in charge of them, um, you know, down there at the hotel overnight and during that time that they are not at the game. So we would want to have this endorsed by the school board and be a school trip. 
as opposed to kids going on their own with their parents. I, I really think this would need to be run through our, such with the new glitch about the coaches not being at the game, it would have to be run by our insurance carrier to make sure, you know, because this would be a school sponsored trip. Mm -hmm. Keith, I assume that if some other coaches for other sports wanted to go with them, that that would be all right? So we would then have someone who was a coach who was working for us? That is correct. That would be all right. But it just cannot be the coach for that sport. Okay. Do you have any sense, Sue, as to whether? Um, I believe the Uptons may have an interest in going. Their daughter plays field hockey. There are Nordic ski Nordic coaches, ski. so they are employed by the, sort of employed by the school <laughs> the department as volunteers, but okay. they have some association right. with the school department. Um, I'm not sure any of the other parents do, other than perhaps one of our school board members or his wife. <laughs> do you have a field trip? If, this trip, if this trip rests on Nancy and I going, we certainly will go. <laughs> so how would you like us to proceed at this point? We do have another board meeting before yeah. that, but I think right. that Sue needs some direction as to whether she should pursue it further. I'm All expenses are incurred yeah. by the students themselves and our boost organization. They have subsidized it somewhat in the past, but the costs um, would be the overnight lodging we have looked into, or our boosters have looked into a hotel, um, would be approximately $18 per night per student. Um, there may be opportunities for some to preview just the Friday night games. Those that need to come home would come home, and those that wanted to stay for the finals, you know, could possibly do that. So things are really a little bit up in the air, not knowing the exact game times and so forth. I have a concern because there's no one specified as in charge from the school's perspective, because I think you're doing some planning, but that doesn't, you, someone's got to be named as the charge person representing the schools. There's the number of chaperones that have to be in place for the number of students. I mean, we have those guidelines. I'm very uncomfortable because we don't have someone specified as being the person in charge is it, from an insurance purpose. Is it possible that the JV coaches could oversee the varsity group and vice versa, or they're all considered? It's all considered part of the Cape Elizabeth um, field hockey high school coaches. So we're all part of that same group. So none of us can, can take the kids to the game. We can be in charge of them right up until that point where they go to the game, but we cannot take them and be in compliance with the MPA guidelines. Any non-coaching faculty members who are particularly interested in field hockey that we could cajole into uh, Might be able going. to do that. That's what we need to do. I mean, Give see, us some guidance. See, I, would, I personally would agree to continuing the planning as long as you can come back to us at our November meeting with a specific person who is in charge, who is going to be the responsible person that meets all the guidelines of, of, of the procedure for trips. Okay. An administrator. Anybody else? Oh, also, yeah. Sue. <laughs> but, you know, there is, there is more data that we need well, to, to approve this trip, like the number of students that are going, who they are, and... Mm -hmm. and well, we weren't aware that no, this school, was going to be in violation of NPA guidelines until 12.30 this afternoon, so we haven't yes. had the opportunity to <coughs> take it that one step further to find someone else who could, could be in charge that would be considered staff. The feeling of the rest of the board? To proceed on in the planning to come back with a Certainly detailed and specifically who is going to be in charge for the whole period of time. And I do think it's a good idea. I know we have many students who have thoughts about playing collegiate, a collegiate sport and going to see a game and, and you know, all the accoutrements that go with that I think is a good experience. So I would encourage pursuing it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I, <clears throat> a motion to close out the school construction balance and what we're going to do with those funds. I move that we transfer the amount of $16,145 from the school building fund to the school contingency account for the purpose for projects recommended by the furnishing committee. 
<clears throat> Second. Any discussion? It would be the understanding that the furnishing subcommittee would make recommendations to the finance subcommittee for approval of those funds. And we had one request so far. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. And our final thing is to consideration of the superintendent's recommendation to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing teacher negotiations. And move that we close this session and move into executive session. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Five zero. I had co curricular to our handing. That's why I had co curricular. Nancy. Hi. Nancy.